everyone to the second seminar of our annual public seminar series. I'm Jenny Middleton, um, a senior research fellow in the TSU and will be chairing today. Just a few um, sort of code of conduct um, announced. Please turn your cameras off and mute your microphones. Um, there'll be an opportunity to ask questions at the end. Um, please do use the hand function. I'll also keep an eye on the chat as well if any questions come through there. But I mean, the hand function would, would be great as well. Um, tiny bit of advertising before I introduce our speaker. Um, we still have a couple of places on our new online urban mobility after COVID course that's due to start in a few weeks. Please look at the TSU website for further details of that if you're interested. And just to flag our next speaker in two weeks time, same time, same place, Anna Nikoliva of the University of Amsterdam, who will be talking on commoning mobility. But I'm delighted to introduce our speaker today, Dr. James Essen. James is a reader in human geography at Loughborough University. James's research is broadly located within the fields of critical development studies and population geography. In particular, his sort of three research areas around migration and the politics of mobility, urban dynamics and unconventional approaches to development. Now, he's published widely on the relationships between inequality, African youth and human trafficking, and also the relationships between ageing, transport and urbanisation in Africa. He's currently writing a monograph on African youth development and transnational migration to be published by Manchester University Press. And last year received the prestigious Taylor and Francis Award from the RGS for his sustained contributions to teaching and learning in higher education, particularly through the race working group. So James is going to speak for the next sort of 35 to 40 minutes. Um, he's got he's teaching at two, so we'll be shutting this, closing the seminar at five to promptly. Um, and the title of his talk today is Conceptualising Everyday Travel and Mobilities through a post-colonial vernacular, insights from elderly Ghanaians. Thank you, James. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Jenny, for that, that really nice introduction. Um, as you've kind of hinted, I'm teaching from two to four. So I will try to, yeah, I, I, can, I can speak to the, the topic today in around 35 minutes or so, which should hopefully leave some time for, for discussions at the end. Now, I want to, to start my presentation by just given a few acknowledgements to, firstly, to the funding body underpinning the research I'm going to discuss, which was the European Commission. And this was part of the Urban Africa research project um, under the, I think, the yeah, FP7 um, EU Commission framework. Then I've also listed some, some scholars and colleagues, both in the UK and also in, in Ghana, who have contributed to some of the work I've written around transport mobilities and livelihoods and ageing over the last few years. So I just wanted to acknowledge these colleagues um, from the outset. Especially a big thank you to Dr. Ebenezer Amankwa, who over the last couple of months or so, we've really been thinking through some of the ideas in this paper around the, the language and going back to our data and, and thinking through um, the vernacular being used by our participants. Um, so yeah, just wanted to acknowledge those, those colleagues before I begin. So the outline for today's talk, there are four key um, elements. So I'm gonna begin hopefully spending yeah, 10, 10 minutes or so providing a little bit of context for, for today's talk. I want to focus here specifically around the emergence of ageing and, and population change in African contexts and how that links to mobilities. I'm then going to look at epistemic challenges within transport geography, but also maybe urban studies more broadly. And then I want to finish that section off by kind of thinking through how we can start to problematize some of the, the epistemic challenges and also address them um, that, that were mentioned earlier on. I'm then going to provide a little, a little bit of, of information about the Urban Africa project to provide the methodological context for, for, for my findings, well, the findings, shall I say, they're not purely mine. And then in the third section, I want to just share some, some insights um, that emerged from our data with the participants in African context, the, the, the elderly participants. And I want to specifically focus on some of the, the vernacular that was being used and to suggest how that vernacular provides some quite unique insights into the lived realities of elderly people in African context, well, in, in Ghanaian, in Ghanaian context. Then I want to end with a few, a few conclusions. And in some ways, the message I want to, to leave you with is quite a, a straightforward one, but one that I hope sounds straightforward, but the implications could perhaps be quite profound for how we think about and do transport geography. And, and my message is simply this, that 
by exploring the mobility of elderly Ghanaians and their, their everyday mobilities and looking at the specificities of those mobilities, they offer fresh perspectives on how transport geography could be conceptualised. And that's, that's, that's the key message I want to leave you with, with today. And of course, as we talk through the, the session, we might think about what some of those implications might be. So let's, let's begin with the, the context. Now, some of you may or may not be aware, but the, at a global level, there's been a lot of interest in population change, specifically around ageing and the fact that our societies are, are living longer and people are, therefore, we have more of an ageing society. To put it very, demographers here are probably screaming out loud, James, what the hell are you doing? It's far more complex than that, but, you know, it's, it's Thursday afternoon, let's keep it straightforward. As part of these conversations, there's been a, a, a real emphasis on the implications of ageing within, for example, African contexts. And, and here it's estimated that, you know, around 2010, there was 43 million, um, what we say, elderly people. And they're expecting that to be 67 million by 2025 and 163 million by 2050. So quite considerable changes to our population um, profile in African context. Now, a lot of the work in this area has focused on non-communicable diseases, um, implications for um, caregiving, um, and which is all, all very well and good. And I think that work should, of, of course, be looked at in that area. But what I want to think about in the talk today is the implications of that for how all people move and live and experience urban environments, specifically in African, African urban environments. Now, there has been some work, of course, been done in the past about uh, mobility and ageing in African context. Um, and I'm thinking here specifically about the work, maybe about the Global Age Friendly Cities initiatives that were, were undertaken by World Health Organization, which had a, a focus on healthy aging and active aging. And as part of healthy and active aging, there was a focus on, on movement and mobilities. Um, now, again, I want to kind of just in this talk today think about how we can enrich that work work further. I also want to stress that there has been work on you know, the, the more kind of sociological side of population change. I'm thinking here of the fantastic work of you know, Isabella Abodarin. I mean, it's yeah, a gender setting where that's been done, looking at, as I said, the social dynamics, inter intergenerational bonds, um, social relations, sociality of ageing. So there's some really rich work on that in that area. I can't speak to all that work today, but just, just I want to acknowledge and signpost for sure that it, it does exist. Now, this is the transport seminar series. Let's move to the transport side of things. You know, for quite some time, now, we've been really aware that there is a literature on ageing of older people in transport geography but it tends to focus on experiences of people in the global and Western Europe and, and Australia. You know, there's very little that we know about ageing outside of the Western world. And that's not a particularly complicated thing to, to, to highlight. I think many of you would maybe appreciate that's the case. But where I think that's important is to think about that in the wider context of transport geography and what that might tell us about the epistemic issues within this, this field. So again, we see this point that Tim Schwannon raises in, in this article in Progress in Human Geography, that this kind of historical hegemony of predominantly Western world views doesn't just apply to the issue of um, ageing and elderly people's experiences of, of urban and I guess rural environments when it comes to transport. It's far more deeply ingrained in the, in, yeah, I guess the, the epistemologies of how we, we do transport geography. And I won't, I won't dwell on this point too long, but in this paper, Tim Schwannon talks about three key thematic ways in which um, these epistemic issues play out. You know, we see the transfer of Western world views um, in a pretty much unchanged way. So the ideas we have in, in the so-called global north apply to global south context, where the mobility of, of ideas, and this is where we start to be more attentive to the particularities of geography and transport geography specifically, when we think through um, issues. Then we have what he calls worlding. And, and this is where actually insights about transport and cities in Africa, Asia, and Latin America allow us to rethink our understandings of transport geography, our concepts, our practices, and, and the way we, um, yeah, the, the way we, we understand the, the function of transport systems. And there've been several, similar conversations when we think about the so-called mobilities turn. And again, I won't spend too long on this. I've only got half an hour in today's um, session and we could have an entire seminar on this. But the point is that the epistemic issues that um, Tim Schwannon pointed to around transport geography has also been discussed and raised in conversation about the so-called mobility term. And for example, Peter um, Ailey talks about how we have alternative mobility. So this idea that 
the mobility term was predominantly focused on the experiences of, of the West and Global North. And that kind of hides and occludes the fact that there's a range of mobility practices taking place, of course, in Global South context, that are not always fully appreciated and acknowledged. Now, one thing for us to think about here is that this kind of push for an alternative mobilities paradigm should also keep in mind that there is actually a much longer standing rich body of work on mobilities and transport studies in the Global South that has been going on for decades. You know, so the question perhaps is not so much that it's an alternative, but we'll start to think as again that point about why it's not considered part of mobility studies proper, why it has to be other, even within these epistemic conversations. So why does all this matter? Um, I know I'm going relatively quickly, but hopefully I'm giving you the headline stuff and we can think things through in more detail later. It matters because of the way in which it shapes how, sorry, these epistemic issues matter for how we, we plan and, and, and think about cities and transport infrastructure. I have a quote here from um, a, a good friend and colleague, um, Jay Rajson Duresen from the London School of Economics. And here he's talking about urban planning in India. And I'll, I'll read the quote out for those who may not be able to, to, to read it. And I, I think it's a really powerful quote, even though it does refer to urban, urban planning. So Jay Raj notes that urban consultants from the United States have designed many a private city in India over the past few decades, emulating the American middle class favorite new urbanist enclaves. National urban and rural missions are just themes and variations from the solution templates of international development agencies and consultants. So here, Jay Raj is kind of almost indicating how coloniality, so the intersubjective relations that emerged through um, empire and colonialism as part of modernity over the last several centuries, have real world implications, not just for how we think about cities, but how we, and urban environments, but how we plan them. And, and I guess as part of the conversation in today's seminar, I want us to think about how we, again, we can start to maybe um, disrupt, might be too strong a word, but yeah, we start to think through how we can problematize these um, problematic implications for theorizing and planning. So how do I want to try and do that in today's seminar? I wanted it by engaging with some, for me, some really fascinating work in post-colonial scholarship in, in urban studies over the last decade or so, that seeks to think about African cities um, and not to fetishize them, not, not to treat African cities as fet in a fetishistic way, but to think about, okay, what is it about African cities that we're not quite grasping through the, as I said, the kind of epistemic approaches and issues that we're, so approaches that we're using currently. Can we find a way to tease out this almost elusive essence of African cities by engaging with it every day and finding out how everyday African cities navigate and move through their urban environments, the socialities, the relationships, as I said, that are formed, um, and also the, the mobilities and, and how that links to, for example, in this case, transport infrastructure. So I'm, I'm very much situating this, this, um, this seminar within that body of work. But more specifically, I'm, I'm also trying to engage with some, some work, for example, by, by Dr. Taban, um, who looks at the ways in which everything we just described in the last 10 minutes or so around epistemic issues they have a very strong grounding in the ways in which we talk about and, and therefore theorize urban environments and in this particular case transport related issues and what dr barn does in a really really provocative and i would say um, but also captivating way in his paper is he says okay let's think about the language that we're using the vocabulary that we're using to think about these urban environments can we start to think about vocabularies that are of the of the global south and are rooted in the empirical context of the global south, which will then help us to theorize from that, that position, and therefore maybe better express the experiences and knowledges and practices taking place in those contexts. Now, again, why, why would um, all of this matter? Or how, sorry, how could this matter in terms of our conversation around, around welding and, and transfer, um, as I mentioned um, earlier on at the start of the talk? This approach, especially if we try to ground our understanding and knowledge of these places in, in, in kind of these empirical contexts, with more specificity, we might be able to think of post-colonial strategies to problematize the very issues that we talked about before, you know, and, and start to almost speak from, and again, this is not a particularly complicated idea, speak from the Global South context. And, and my aim in this talk today is to think about how we can maybe try to insert that language into the transport um, lexicon that we use. And I'll give a few um, very short case studies later on as I try to, to, to do that. So, so to recap, 
um, that that kind of opening context. Um, three key points. The first one is that we're seeing massive, um, we're seeing population change um, globally. But in the African context, we're seeing um, aging, and there's a um, a real lack currently of understanding of how aging is experienced in the context of transport geography beyond the West. This is, is quite a straightforward point. Now, what I want to suggest here is that that is not in of itself a reason to do something, you know. So when I think about conversations with my un undergraduate students with dissertation, they say, oh, James, I'm going to do this because nobody's done this before. And I say to them, well, you know, no one's done any research on how often James goes to the toilet, but it doesn't make it worth doing. So my point is not here to just say that let's do this because nobody else has done it. I'm saying that we should think about the experiences of ageing beyond the West because it helps us to start to address and challenge some of the epistemic issues in transport geography and mobilities and in urban studies more generally that I alluded to earlier on. I want to suggest here that actually speaking to older people and seeing how they experience the cities, almost thinking about mobilities from the epistemological and empirical margins provides us opportunities to think of some fresh perspectives that can speak back to these kind of bigger hegemonic um, and so well, Western narratives about how transport unfolds um, currently. So I, I guess in a sense, I'm thinking of using the insights from elderly people as a way of welding. And I want to do that by thinking about language and vocabulary, but more specifically vernacular, so the local language that people are using and how that shapes or is informed by some of the transport infrastructure and practices that unfold in their everyday mobilities. So that's hopefully a, a, a recap of, of the, the first part of, of the context. I'm just keeping an eye on time to so know that I promised I'll be finished by, by 35 past. So now what I want to do is to provide a little bit of context about the Urban Africa project um, that I was, um, I was a lead research assistant on one of the work packages. So we had multiple work packages and one of those work packages was around city dynamics. I'll talk through that in a moment. So I don't know if anybody can spot me in this picture. Um, I'll give you a couple of seconds to see if you can see me. If you can't, five, four, three, two, one. Um, so I am on the right hand side wearing a bright blue blue top. Now what you can, what well, green top, what we can hopefully gather from the project, it was, it was large, of course, it's a European Commission project, FP7, but also think about the countries involved in this. So I'm trying to subtly allude back to the point we made around um, epistemic challenges and, and global north knowledge and how they circulate and how that might be linked to kind of coloniality and modernity um, writ large. So we have Cameroon, Denmark, France, Ghana, Netherlands, Rwanda, Tanzania. I'm sure many of you will be quick enough to realise that there are colonial connections across many of those countries. Now, one of the things the Urban Africa Project was quite keen to do was to not reproduce those global north, global south inequalities. I'd be happy to talk through how they tried to do that in the Q&A session afterwards. And yeah, there I am. So as I said, I was the lead researcher sitting on work package three, which looked at city dynamics. Now, the focus of this work package was to try to understand how the everyday mobility and, and livelihood practices of urban residents in African cities. Alongside that, we were trying to understand how urban residents connect to rural areas, mainly through their livelihoods, but also through familiar relations and, and other activities and how those mobilities were shaped by socioeconomic characteristics. The project was primarily qualitative for this work package. There were other work packages that were far more, were definitely more quantitative in nature. We used focus group discussions with an aim of around 20 focus groups per city um, and around 125 semi-structured in-depth interviews per city. And within each city, we'd identify normally five neighborhoods with a range of characteristics, primarily one that's more in the peripheral areas, one that was more central in the business district, one that was a high or middle, in, middle to high income area, one that was a low income area, and one that would be considered as an indigenous um, population, well, yeah, primarily with an indigenous core. And the countries involved in Roman Africa were Ghana, Rwanda, Cameroon, Tanzania, as I, I've, I've said before, and these are the, the cities that were involved. So for each country, we picked uh, often a primary or capital city, but definitely one of the, the, the larger cities. And then we picked a secondary city. And 
yeah, I won't go into too much detail about why that happened in the way that it always happened, but there's one primary city and then one, one secondary city. For today's paper, I'm going to focus primarily on the Ghana, well, I'm not primarily on the Ghana data, um, and there have been subsequent publications about the other, other, other countries, but I'm focused today just on, on the Ghana dimension. So I said before that we use qualitative interviewing in terms of focus groups and one-to-one -one interviews. Here is a, a very brief overview of the, I guess, the, the totality of the data that was collected. You might be wondering why we aimed for people at 55 years and above. Um, and we did so because the life expectancy of, of men and women in Ghana was around you know, the, the mid to low 60s. So we therefore consider anybody above the age of 55 as, as rel being relatively elderly in the Ghanaian context. I want to also stress here that I'm using elderly in terms of um, life course and age. <clears throat> I don't mean at I don't mean in terms of elder. So to be an elder has different connotations that can be a, a social signifier. We're talking about elderly here in terms of, of, of age and, and life and life stage. Um, hopefully you could be able to see the map just to give you a very brief idea of the geography of sorry a very simple idea of the geography of Ghana and the two key um, cities that we went to. As I said, Accra is a capital city. Secondly, Takradi is um, a very important secondary city. It's emerged, um, well, it's always been a very important city, especially for its its um, its, its position on the, on the coastline, but it's emerged as a, a key place in terms of oil and gas industry in the last few years. And that being said, the majority of people in the in the city are still relatively on, on low incomes. Um, so, so yeah. And I apologize, I can't go into a lot more detail about the, the demographics of the of the cities just for the, the, the due to time. So that hopefully gives you a flavor of the, the data that we the, the data that we collected, where we collected it, and um, yeah, the, the Urban Africa project in a nutshell. So what I now want to do, I've got just over 10 minutes left. I want to yeah, switch focus now to discuss some of the, some of the findings. And what I, I will say as I I'm, as I move to the findings is that I'm, I've tried my best to express I'm going to try my best to express the the, the points using the local vernacular. Um, as many of you can probably realise, I'm, well, I'm Ghanaian by birth and parentage, but I've lived in the United Kingdom for the last thirty. I actually don't want to say how let you know how old I am for a long time. <laughs> so I have a, a very as you can tell British accent. So, yeah, when I pronounce some of the words, the Ghanaian people on the call just say, James, what are you doing? You're butchering our language. So, yeah, please forgive me, but I'll try my try my best. So what I want to do at the start of the discussion, the findings is to give you a little taster of some of the the, the, the exchanges that we had as part of the, the interviews and focus groups. I'm going to use the example of of Enoch, who's a retired prison officer living in in, in Accra. I, I didn't do this interview, so I'll, I'll read it out. I didn't conduct this interview, but it was, yeah, I've, I've read and analyzed all the transcripts, and it was one that just really stuck out to me because it, it, it highlighted the, the playfulness of some of the interviews. So interviewer asked Enoch, how old are you? Enoch replies, the age I've been keeping a secret, and you want me to disclose it? It is for this reason I don't respond to questionnaires. The interviewer then says, you know, what is your highest level of education? All these things are worrying. If I tell you I have never been at school, you may wonder why a nice gentleman like me has never been to school. Please, what is your occupation? An old man like me, can you employ me at your work? Now, for me, I found this exchange just it was actually quite hilarious when you when you read the transcript because Enoch was just so playful. But what Enoch did in a really clever way here was problematize our, our normative understandings of, of conducting interviews, but also the human subject. So, so what Enoch does in a very subtle way here is kind of problematize the kind of homo economicus um, approach that you know, Silver Winter, the decolonial scholars problematize about how we understand the human subject. And this idea of, you know, your occupation, your, you know, the economic um, pr predominance of what we're asking our, our participants. You know, this point about, it's for this reason I don't respond to questionnaires. You know, so he's, Enoch was in a really kind of a nice playful way problematizing the whole research process. Um, and yeah, I just thought that was a nice kind of anecdote to, to, to share. But why it also matters, and it comes on to the next point, is that Enoch was retired. Um, that's what he told us. But when we started to speak to Enoch a little bit more about what being retired meant, we realised that not only was he still quite active, 
um, day to day, but he was really engaging with transport infrastructure and, and, and mobilities in his everyday life. So let's let's move to one of the the, the first three three kind of thematic areas that I'd like to, to share with you today as part of the seminar. So one of the key um, themes that emerged, and it probably won't surprise you, is that the elderly participants tended to be what we would call it in, in England or Britain, retired. And, and when we're trying to think through our analysis and we're talking to the participants, we noticed that this is a really good example of the post-colonial legacy of, of British, well, sorry, of British colonialism, in that being retired is a word that, you know, when we spoke to our participants, we couldn't quite find the perfect, well, not the right translation for it. So one thing that people are saying is minyejma, minyejma. That means that I don't work, I'm not working. But you could say that's about any point in your life stage, yeah? Um, so that, that was a really kind of interesting point that emerged when we said minyejma, and then we kind of tease that further. And we heard a lot of people saying, mitifye, mitifye, I'm at home, I'm just at home, I'm not doing anything. So then we tried to get a sense of the, you know, their, their daily biographical mobility. So we said, okay, tell, talk us through your day. What, what are you doing? And then we then found out that in many cases, as I said with Enoch, they weren't at home, they were quite busy, but also they were acting as catalysts for mobilities of other people. Yeah. So some of the people in the in the richer neighborhoods um, and the more middle income areas had what we call abuafu. So these are home helpers. Yeah. So these people often in the mornings, they were the ones who were going out running the errands. Um, they were. Um, so say, for example, the elderly person, something as simple as, as shopping. Yeah, those are the people who were tasked with that role of going out into to, into um, yeah into into the the society to to do that that type of thing. And as I'm going to say later on, that has implications for the wider transport system in terms of who's doing what, when, and why, and and how they're doing it. The idea of mitifia, I'm at home, I'm not doing anything, I'm not doing anything, was actually not really accurate. Also, in terms of I'm just at home, we realised that many of the elderly residents were spending a lot of time going to, and this sounds quite morbid, going to funerals. And you might say, well, James, why does that matter for transport um, kind of geography? It matters because in Ghana, often funerals happen at the weekend. So you tend to see, a, um, especially, yeah, Friday afternoon moving onwards, you start to see lots and lots of traffic heading out of the city centres yeah, as people are going to, to, to funerals. And often people don't realise that much of that movement is being caused by these old people who say, Mitifia. And how are they traveling to these places? Often, either in, um, what's what I'm looking for? Cars, so aut automobiles, private automobiles, or they're going in in, in what we call trotters, like local buses. And those buses are not particularly comfortable. So there's issues there for lower income elderly people and kind of, um, yeah, the challenges they face navigating those transport systems. Or they're going using what we call the VIP buses, which are slightly more expensive. But as you can tell by the name VIP, um, they're, they're, they're more comfortable. So yeah, that, that just kind of speaks to that. They also made reference to what we call in Ghana, Gora Gora boys. Now these are different to home helpers. The home helpers, people who literally, they, 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 may, they mainly live with you and they help you around the house. The Gora Gora boys are people that you, you hire on a, on a more informal, informal, infrequent basis. Now, the reason why this matters is that many of these boys are now using in Ghana what we call Okada transport, um, the, the, the motorbikes. The Okada people are, are taxis on motorbikes. And that has had an implication in terms of just the, the ways in which um, trans, sorry, traffic flows within the city. So people who are able to jump on these buses and, and move through the city and navigate them in, in their own ways. Now, the reason why the Goro Goro boys um, are... No, I'll come back to that point in a minute. I was going to say it's all about catalyzing our mobilities a bit more, but I've just noted the time. I want to just get to a final point in this slide. So in the middle income areas and the enclaves, we, we realized that some people who were saying Mitifia, they're at home, which is true. But they were able to have far more um, personalized form of mobility because they had access to their own driver. So some people who were saying Mitifia, I'm at home, and they had to rely on the Goro Goro boys who they, they'd have to call on the mobile phone and say, can you come and either collect me to take me somewhere or can you come and, um, or can I, can you go to the shop and buy something for me? Here, the rich people are able to say, I just call my driver and the driver's able to take me to wherever I want, want to go to. So here we started to get into the, the inequalities that elderly people face 
in their transport mobilities. The next thing I want to look at very briefly is what I would what happened around kind of the more economically active elderly people. So they would talk about um, oh yeah oh yeah in gar that means um, doing things quickly quickly. Their their business they had to keep it moving. They had to keep it moving. And I want to emphasise here the ways in which some of these older um, residents, especially the women who were involved, for example, Amma, who was living in Accra in the periphery of, 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 of on the periphery, and sells um, kenke, so it's a, a local um, delicacy of food made from maize. And Amma had quite complex migration, um, sorry, daily mobility patterns to source the maize for her kenke. So what she'd have to normally do is wake up around 4 a.m and go to her local markets um, using the what we call the trotter, the local buses. She had to leave at 4 a.m. as early as she possibly can so she could start her cooking early, but also because she had more chance of getting a bus at that time. She found this incredibly tiring, incredibly um, draining on the body. And also when she would buy it from the local market, she paid a lot more for her, her produce. However, when she travels to a place further out, much further out, two hours away, she could get the produce much cheaper. So in her local market, she'd pay 110 cities for it. She could travel further out and pay 50 cities for the maize, and the, the travel cost of 20 cities. So she'd save a lot of money, but she had the, the burden of, of traveling further away. So what did Amma do to try to, to alleviate the challenges of, of, this, um, of this issue? Amma and other market traders were involved in forms of collective uh, mobilities. And that means let's do this together. And, and what they were doing is that they were saying, OK, let's, for example, have Amma go on one day and then I will go the other day and someone else will go the other day and we'll take it in turns to go. Alternatively, what would happen is that Amma would travel really far out the place I mentioned before. And then when she'd arrive at that place, she'd get together with other women and say, yeah, Mbue, let's do this together. And then they would hire a taxi collectively, pull their resources and come back together. Now, what I would say if I had more time is that this idea of collectivity in transport mobilities has implications for around how we can make our mobilities more sustainable in the gardening context. I wouldn't, it's not car sharing, that's not what's happening. It's something far more nuanced and sophisticated in terms of this idea of collectivization and mobility um, through the transport system. There are also elements of intergenerational relations that, that kind of came through because Anna was doing all this work in order to continue to help her, her her family, especially her, her grandchildren, to pay their way through school. And again, if I had more time, I'd talk you through how that was also influencing her daily transport mobilities, her, her childcare responsibilities. Now, again, I won't speak too long on this slide, but what I wanted to do just very, very briefly was to give you a sense of the distances that Amma would sometimes travel in order to get the maize to cook her, um, her, her kenke on her, on her food store. So on the left hand side of the screen, you can see the the um, the, the really far journey that she'd take when I said it would cost her, you know, 50 cities to buy the maize, 20 cities for travel. Whereas in Medina, which is a lot closer, it's only 25 minutes away, she'd have to pay a lot more um, for, 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 for the maize. So that's just to give you a visual representation of the type of journey that I'm talking about in terms of distance and also time. Now, of course, this is time if you're in a, in a car. When Amma is going by local bus, it takes a lot, a lot longer. Now I'm on the on the final two slides, and and I'll, I'll start to, to wrap things up for the for the conclusion. Uh, uh, um, so, so a, a thing that that Did came out in the in the interviews with the elderly residents in the high income neighbourhoods was the idea of of moving out. Yeah, so lots of them are getting older. They often lived in neighborhoods that were, as I said, the higher income, highly valuable. And they were literally selling their properties and moving to the outskirts of the city where things were, where land is cheaper. And they get, of course, um, they could, they could, they could um, um, yeah, make, make money and also um, live in a more comfortable, comfortable environment financially. Now, mo this moving out process is important here because what was happening is that as they were moving out of these areas, they often weren't being purchased by other people living there for residential reasons. They're being purchased by, um, and this might sound very odd to, to people on the call, but they're being purchased by um, companies. So companies are buying houses in residential areas and turning them into offices. 
And that was completely changing the transport um, infrastructure in the area. So they were no longer getting buses coming to those areas and taxis were far less frequent um, because people were coming to work often using private car. And therefore, the, the taxis tended to and sorry, buses were not coming to those areas as much. They didn't come to them as much anyway because they were more um, elite and high end. But my point simply here is that that movement of um, elderly residents to the other parts, the outskirts of the city, had knock on effects for city dynamics within the areas that they were leaving, which then had knock on effects for the transport that was available. So people like Edna, who, was, who stayed in that area and still lives in those neighbourhoods, has her, um, far more reduced transport options as a result of this mobility, the residential mobility. So Edna noticed how luck a private car and a driver, she said that if I didn't have a private car and a driver, I'd have to probably stand by the roadside in the hope that I'd be able to get a taxi to go somewhere. Or she'd have to maybe start to use things like Uber, which she said she found quite, um, you know, which, well, she didn't mention this at the time. We didn't talk about Uber during this period of time when we did the data collection. But I wonder how someone like Edna would, would navigate and using technology like, like Uber. I'm now on the, on, the, on the final slide before I get to the conclusion. And I want to, again, return to the, the periphery of the city. So I mentioned how elderly people are moving to the outskirts of the city. And one of the challenges that they face when they move there is that very often the, the public transport facilities and also the, the private transport don't tend to, to always want to go that far out to the outskirts of the city. And when they do, they often have what they call last stop. So this is the transport terminal where, as it kind of says in the name of the tin, is a last stop. And people who, when they get to that point, have to continue onwards on their journey, then have to try and find another mode of transport to do so. And this is often very challenging for elderly people because they either have to, to walk, sometimes very long distances, which they find really challenging, or they have to end up in negotiations. And again, this is a theme that I think in terms of kind of post-colonial vernacular, when we think about how we start to conceptualize transport studies moving forward, we might have to think about, is how people negotiate their transport um, provision. So one of the things they were talking about is where boom me, like, and, you know, reduce it for me. And what they were trying to get here is that the transport providers were very much aware that these people were in, in many cases, a vulnerable position. They needed to get somewhere. They knew the transport options were quite limited. And therefore, that gave them less bargaining power. So often these older elderly people often found themselves in quite you know, difficult positions in trying to negotiate um, yeah, um, a, a rate for transport and travel that they could afford. So again, it speaks this point about kind of social justice and, and inequities within the transport system. They did also mention there's many young people who say, oh, you know, mommy, it's OK, or uncle, it's fine. You know, and they, they try to give you a more reasonable rate. But they, as I said before, they're in a very vulnerable position, you know, where they, they need the transport service. They need to get from the last stop to their home. And sometimes that can lead them end up in, yeah, as I said, where boomy. They have end up in negotiations that don't go so well, where they could be exploited. And I was going to talk again very briefly about intergenerational relations here, but we can maybe discuss that in the in the Q and A if somebody wants me to to discuss that point further. I was mainly going to mainly going to just say here that what also happens here is that you tend to find that um, children or grandchildren or nephews and nieces will also start to play more of a role in trying to help their elderly and relatives when they move to the periphery by giving them more support in terms of having to avoid being stuck at a last stop. So I realise that I, I'm, I've almost gone over time. I think I'm just about 38 minutes, so I'll, I'll start to wrap up here. So what I wanted to try and do in today's seminar, admittedly only in, in 35 minutes, was to start to think about how we can think about the epistemological and empirical margins of transport geography. And I wanted to do that by thinking about the ways in which elderly people in Ghanaian context experience their everyday mobilities and how their mobility, how their immobilities in some cases might be a catalyst for other forms of mobility within the Ghanaian context. Through doing so, I wanted to start to tease out some of the, the elusive essence of African cities. And I think there were a couple of themes that emerged in the talk that I think speak to that, that topic. The first was around um, the, the collectivization, the collective um, uh, endeavor around how the, the market traders and the women were trying to negotiate the challenges around their everyday mobilities to source their produce. And Amma's case is, is, was not particularly unique. I just used it as, as an example. Many of the people that we spoke to who were still engaged in economic activities were involved in some type of collective action um, through, in terms of their mobilities. 
And I guess here that might give us an idea, well, I think it does speak to some of the ways in which reciprocity, um, but also speculation unfolds in African contexts and how that relates to transport um, mobilities. Now, when I say speculation, I'm, I'm also thinking here in terms of, well, maybe not so much speculation, but in terms of Weibomi, the way in which people at the last stop um, are faced with inequities in their, their access to, to transport services and how they have to negotiate those on, 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 a, on a, in some case, a daily basis. Yeah. So that, that, that kind of theme. And again, it speaks to work in transport geography recently around kind of injustice and, 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 and having a more equitable transport um, um, geography. And then the, the third theme, and that's actually the first one that I, I started, was this idea of um, I'm just at home. And how when older people say they're just at home in the Ghanaian context, that sometimes hides the range of mobilities that are unfolding in their day to day lives. But also, as I said, how they act as a catalyst for other forms of, of mobility um, within the city. And yes, what I, I'm hoping is that some of the ideas that I talked about today and the language that I've used when we write this up into a paper, hopefully in the next few, few months, we can start to insert into how we understand um, transport geography and and almost have it as part of our intellectual vernacular, you know, the, the, the ways in which we think about concepts in transport. So the idea of the last stop, you know, and the idea of negotiation through um, a post-colonial Ghanaian lens, how that might speak to how we understand issues of negotiation in transport, um, more, maybe more broadly. So yeah, I will, I will stop there, Jenny, because I think I've, I've gone a little bit over time, but I will, I will stop there. <laughs>